It's been almost 20 years since Nintendo first showcased the Nintendo DS to the world, and while it wasn't the most powerful handheld of the day, it went on to outsell every handheld in history by a large margin. To this day, Nintendo has never had a better selling console than the DS, and there's a good reason for that. Hello everyone, my name is Taki, and this is the Nintendo DS in 2023. What can it do? How can it be improved? And is it worth buying today? Just like the PSP video that I did, I started this journey by scoping out the secondhand market for DS units that were close to my house. The DSi was the first unit that I bought, and this is how it looks after it's been cleaned. I originally planned to use this for a shell swap, but DSi replacement shells aren't good, so this one will stay stock. I wasn't having any other luck getting units near my house, so I decided to head out to the electronics market, and I found a guy that had a few units for sale. That's when I bought this crusty beast. Before today, I had never put my hands on this model, even though I have used Nintendo DS units for years. This one never appealed to me, but we have something very interesting in store for this. We need to use the jaws of life to get this thing open because this has a ton of sticker residue all over the inside. The same person that sold me that had two other DS lights for sale that I bought while I was in his shop. Even though this looks nasty and I'm gonna have to soak my hands in alcohol, the internal components aren't that bad. The last device that I bought was the worst in terms of case and component damage. This is a white DS Lite and these usually go for a high premium where I live even when they are in garbage condition. This one has what looks like a dead battery and a missing stylus but I think it might clean up well after seeing how my white PSP turned out. Now that we had a chance to take a look at the devices that I bought for this video, let's now go over repair, modding, and some issues that you're going to want to look out for. If you're lucky, cleaning the unit that you buy will be your best option. The footage that I took of this before I cleaned it wasn't that clear, but this is how it looks after I have completely cleaned the white DS light that I bought. And I think it turned out pretty well. If you look on the side here, this area right here that I didn't get to film that clearly was caked with orange junk and the same thing could be said for the other side. The lid cleaned up very well, just has some minor imperfections here, but I wasn't able to make a lot of progress with the top portion here and here. Now, when I bought this unit, I was not originally intending to use it with this original shell. I had another plan for this, but it ended up cleaning up so well that I think I'm just going to keep it as it is. I think this looks pretty nice, especially for the money that I paid for it. The good thing about these Nintendo DS units is that they're really easy to service. This DS Lite was cleaned by just removing this back shell, taking off the back shell and the buttons. And I also ended up removing this front shell here by taking off the four screws and then popping that up. That allowed me to clear the rest of the gunk that was stuck next to this rubber stopper on both sides. The only problem that I'm left with is the D-pad and I did buy a set of replacement buttons for this that aren't here yet at the time that I'm filming this portion of the video. For whatever reason, somebody like used the strongest super glue known to man on this d-pad and i wasn't able to remove it through everything that i tried so i just decided to buy a replacement set but even though this thing looks pretty jank it is way better than the orange mess that it was before i cleaned it i imagine that i'll have that replacement part before i finish this video but this is how it looks at this point and i think it came out really well for the price that i paid for this i also tried my best to clean up the black ds light that i bought i was not intending to use this one with the original shell but since the white one turned out so well I decided to see if I could try to make this one look better and this is about as good as I got it. The outside of the shell is pretty rough but the inside doesn't look that bad so I'm going to keep this shell in case I have another mod that could use it in the future. When I bought this DSi I was planning to do a shell swap for it but the quality of replacement shells for the DSi is not where I would want it to be so I'm just going to keep this thing as stock and probably just put a sticker over it because it doesn't bother me that much. DS light shells are entirely different. I had three of these shells originally and I was planning to use two of them, but I only ended up using one. These are the ones that are left over and I'm going to use them again in the future when I can get another DS light for a good price. I turned my black DS light into this and I think it looks amazing. This is one of the best transparent shell colors that you can get in the set that are offered right now. 
In terms of difficulty, I would say this is one of the easier shell swaps that I've done. There are some annoying parts about doing a PSP shell swap that are easier to do on this one. The only thing that you're really going to have to deal with when it comes to the DS Lite are the shoulder buttons and the ribbon cable for the display on the top half. I found the entire experience like pretty enjoyable, which is why I'm going to use the remaining two shells that I have on future DSs that I'm able to purchase. The best part about this entire thing is the black DS Lite that I had had decent screens. It just had a really ugly shell, so this was a great way to breathe some new life into the entire thing. Now, even though this thing looks great, it does have one problem. Unfortunately, when I was putting this back together, I ended up breaking a power switch that was a bit on the weak side from years of use. So the only way to use this right now is to put something inside here to move the slider manually. Thankfully, I was able to get some repair parts for this, but it's not a super easy fix to do, so I'm going to put this on the back burner for now. I'm not even going to bother trying to clean up the original DS shell that I bought because it's way too damaged. And unfortunately, the replacement shells for this version of the DS are pretty crap, but I was able to get an interesting one that I'm planning to use to mod out this shell. Usually you can only buy this as a complete product, but I was able to buy replacement shells for the Nintendo DS ML, which is a replacement shell for the DS that turns it into a DS Lite. I'm pretty hyped about this one because I haven't seen anyone doing a shell swap with this shell. Usually they're only buying the completed unit, so this is going to be probably the first time that anybody's ever seen this. But yeah, first impressions, it definitely seems like a decent shell, way better than the one that's on my DS right now. This DS has two problems. The first is that the touch screen on the bottom doesn't work, but I did buy a replacement part for that. The second problem is that the screens aren't great, but I did buy a set of replacement screens that I'm hoping look better than this. This is not the best DS that you can use for this mod, but I will talk more about that at the end of the video when I'm talking about my suggestions for the DS models that I think you should pick up. Broken touchscreens like this bring me to the next topic that I want to go over, which are the common problems that you're probably going to experience when you're buying these kinds of devices in 2023. The first one is you'll probably have devices that are listed as not powering on. This can be caused by a variety of things, but I think one of the things that I would look out for is whether or not the device is able to light up one of these LED lights when you connect it to a charger. If you connect it to a charger with a battery that you know works and you see an orange blinking light, then you probably have one of the easier problems to fix, which is a problem with the fuse. On the DS light control boards, there's an F1 fuse right here. And if this one goes out, then you will not be able to turn on the device. And this is a problem that I had on my DSi. You can't see it right now, but when I was putting this entire thing back together, the device wouldn't power on. And I did a lot of trial and error to find out that it was that fuse issue. This is not something super safe to do long term, but I just put some solder over this F1 fuse and that helped the device turn on. After I was able to do that and test out the device, I ended up buying these replacement boards and I'm just going to swap that over into the shell when I get a chance. Another common problem that you'll see are broken touchscreens, and this is something that I now have on two of the devices that I own. This DSi didn't originally have a broken touchscreen, but it does now, and then it's partially due to me. This connector here is the bane of my existence, and it's really annoying to get this thing into place on older connectors that have had a lot of use, especially if somebody has taken apart their DS before. The only good thing about this is the replacement part for this is super cheap and easy to get a hold of, and I'm planning to do a fix for this DSi and that original DS before I finish this video. That part just hasn't arrived yet. The next most common issue that you'll hear about are broken hinges, and that's also an easy thing to fix, but it's a bit pricier than some of the other things that can go wrong. I didn't want to deal with that at all, so I only bought devices that I knew had a working hinge. The last issue that you're likely to experience when you're on the market for these are yellowing screens, and this is going to be more common on the older DS models. I have this to some extent on most of the DSs that I own. This one is probably the worst in terms of how it looks. So if I turn this DS light on, you might be able to see some yellowing on the top corner of the top panel and in the same position on the bottom one. This is only noticeable on white screens like this, and once you're in a game, it doesn't really bother you that much, but for something like this, it does kind of stand out. If I boot up this R4 card, it will have a white screen for a longer period of time, and then it's easier to see that this top portion here is yellowing. You can fix this by using an aftermarket screen, but if it's not that bad, I would say just deal with it. I will say that the replacement screens for the DS are not as good as they are on the PSP, so I would only use the replacement screen if I was able to see what it looked like before I bought it. So for this shell, I know these two screens look decent, so these would be a good candidate to use on another shell that I was trying to repair. You can also get into a situation where you'll have a DS that has two screens with completely different color temperatures, and I think that's more likely to happen when you do a screen replacement. 
This is my favorite DS and it does have that issue, but I haven't replaced the screens. The top screen is much cooler in terms of color temperature than the bottom one. And this is kind of distracting when I'm playing games that use a lot of white textures. The thing that we haven't talked about yet is ghosting. And just like the PSP, ghosting is another issue that you're gonna have to deal with on these older devices. And it's more of a problem on some of these DS units than it is on others. What I wanna do now is a ghosting test that I did in the PSP video that I made, just so you can see the differences between each panel in the DS models. The first one we're gonna do is on this ugly beast and it's a bit dark, so you're gonna have to bear with it. But the ghosting on this one isn't that bad. I'm gonna try my best to clean this up in post, but what you're looking for in this scene is the trail that will follow behind these brown blocks here. If you see a bigger trail, that means that there is more ghosting in the panel and it has a slower response rate. On this panel, it's not that bad. Now let's go to the DS lights. Here's that white DS light, and the first thing that you're gonna notice is the screen is much better, but it does have a bit of extra ghosting. We'll do that same test again, and you should be able to notice that the blocks have a bit of extra ghosting on them. Okay, let's check my other DS light. This is the blue DS light, and it's pretty much in line with the white one. Now let's bump up to the DSi. Here's the DSi, and the situation is pretty similar to what it was on the DS lights. Finally, we have the DSi XL, and this is the only one that seems to be similar to the original DS in the test that I did. I'll also throw in a comparison with the PSP that I've modded with an IPS screen. And here's the PSP. Again, this one has the IPS screen. It would be a lot worse than this with the stock screen. One of the best parts about owning an NDS in 2023 is that they're very easy to mod, to run homebrew and emulators. Depending on the model that you have, you have a few different options that you can go with. If you have a DSi or a DSi XL, you can buy something like this. These are our four cards and they're very cheap and easy to get a hold of in 2023. You also have the ability to use some exploits to be able to run things like Twilight Menu on a DSi or a DSi XL with the SD card slot. This is something that you cannot do on the DS Lite or the original DS. So for those devices, the R4 card is your only option. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this because this can really get in the weeds. There are a ton of R4 cards or other kinds of flash cards and not all of them operate in the same way. The differences between all of the flashcards was more important like 10 years ago, but there are still some flashcards that are better than others. For the most part, you're pretty much just going to be buying an R4 card, which are just all clones of the same thing now, and they'll be able to run on all of the NDS models. The only thing to be aware of with these kinds of cards is there are some cards that have a date label on them that have a time bomb, and that basically just means that they'll stop working when the clock on your device is over a few years from the date that's printed here. They do that so that way you'll end up buying another one, but you don't really need to and there's ways to get around it. But it's important to note that not all of the R4 cards do this. As I said, there are cards that are better than this, like objectively better than these R4 clones, but they're not produced anymore, so it's not really worth going over. The only thing that they can do better than these cards in 2023 is that they have better emulation support for Super Nintendo, but it's not that big of a difference. These ones go for a couple of dollars and I don't think it's worth considering those other ones in 2023. But essentially all you have to do when you get one of these is just put an SD card in with the firmware that runs on it and then you'll be good to go. If you use one of the exploit methods on a Nintendo DSi, then you'll just have an SD card with the firmware that you need and then you'll be good to go. Both of these units are set up with Twilight Menu right now and once you boot them up fully, the experience between them is gonna be the same. In the past, these cheap R4 cards couldn't run GBA on the DS or the DS Lite and you could only run those things on the DSi or the DSi XL. But with the new software that exists in 2023, you can run Game Boy Advance on any NDS model with any R4 card. If you have these older NDS models, you also have the ability to use GBA flashcards. This is the one that I use on my GBA SP, and it works perfectly fine on this. These things work really well. The only problem is they don't get any updates anymore, so if something doesn't work, then it's probably never going to work. And the second issue is that these cards use an FPGA that uses more power than a normal GBA card would. But the great thing about this version of the DS is that you have the freedom to use real DS games and real GBA games. But you can use flashcards for either of those if you want. I have an interesting little tidbit for you guys. Some of the teams that used to make and sell these R4 cards actually went on to make and sell the gaming devices that I review on this channel. Not many people know that. Here's that DS ML build. This case didn't come with any instructions, but I was feeling kind of confident after doing the DS Lite shell swap. 
This is the short version of the build, and I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. Technically, this shell swap is a bit easier to do than other DS units because the ribbon cable is easier to manage. Before swapping out the bottom screen, I wanted to get a better clip to show how damaged it was. Then, I just needed to put in the new screen and close up the entire thing. And here we have it. We basically have a DS Lite in a bigger shell. I think this feels a lot better than the original DS did, so I don't regret doing this, and I was able to learn one thing that I want to share. But if you're wondering why there's no frame on the top panel, that's because the screen cover doesn't fit perfectly in this shell, and I didn't have enough time to line it up. As I mentioned, I swapped out the bottom screen of the DSML, and I added a new aftermarket digitizer. I immediately noticed that the screen wasn't as clear as it was before. This is the original glass part, and this is the replacement. Based on this, the replacement seems better than the OEM one in terms of clarity, but let's take a look at that plastic digitizer that goes on this glass. The original one is very clear, while the replacement is noticeably worse. It makes the bottom screen way worse than it was with the stock part. And that's why even though this screen doesn't have as much damage as the original one did with black spots all over the place, it looks a lot worse than it did before, so I'm gonna be on the lookout for a stock screen from a broken DS. The aftermarket touchscreen parts just seem to be this bad because the same thing happened with my DSi. Now we're gonna look at what you can do with a DS, and the first thing is obviously to play DS games. The Nintendo DS has an enormous library of games, and there are a ton of awesome titles waiting to be played, especially if you've never played this platform before. DSiWare games are another category worth checking out. You might assume that you can only play these on a DSi or a DSi XL, but that is not true. With a flash card, you can play some of these games on earlier DS models. Here's a DSiWare game working on a DS Lite, and here's another one on the original DS. You aren't going to be able to play all of the games that are out there, but you will be able to play some of the titles that don't require a bunch of additional RAM. The next thing that these can do well is GBA, and depending on the unit that you have, you're gonna essentially have flawless GBA performance. If you buy an older one with a GBA slot, just insert that cartridge into the unit and reboot it to launch the game. For me to play GBA games on these, they would have to do the job better or as well as an AGS 101, but in classic Nintendo fashion, Obviously, your next device deserves a worse screen than the one that came before it. That makes perfect sense. In this case, I wouldn't use this DS for GBA games, but I wanted to show how this looks on other DS models. There are ones that rival what you can get on an AGS 101. I think this one isn't that lopsided. The colors look good on this screen, and it is reasonably bright. Even the screen on my junk DS Lite holds up well in this comparison. My DSi isn't as bright as those, but it also looks decent for this system. If I use the bottom screen with that new digitizer, it easily goes to the AGS 101. That just leaves us with the DSi XL. This is a decent option, but I'd rather go with the DS Lites because I like how those screens handle these games. At the end of the day, it's up to personal preference. Now we're at the point where we need to rely on the emulation performance of this device, and that includes for Game Boy Color and Game Boy games. We have a few scaling options that we can pick for these titles, but not all of them look great on the DS. The games run well, and one of the things that I like the most is that we have the ability to fast forward, which is awesome for grinding out some games. Let's wrap up the handheld systems with Game Gear, Neo Geo Pocket, and Wonder Swan. Now let's take a look at some home consoles. We're gonna test out NES, Master System, PC Engine, and Genesis. Things are gonna get a bit wonky for some of the titles that we test for Genesis, but the earlier systems run well on this device. Thank <laughs> you. 
I wanted to put Super Nintendo in its own section since that's where the emulation capability of this old device struggles the most. There are a lot of playable titles on here, but there are just as many games that have graphical issues or performance issues where the games will need to be using speed hacks to get close to what they would be at normal speed. The emulator for this system hasn't been updated in a very long time, so it's hard to know how far this device could have gone. The processor is on the weak side, so it's impressive that things even work this well. Let's wrap up this showcase with some homebrew, and there are some interesting and useful titles for this platform. The first one is not that useful, but it is cool. This is DS2Win, and it's an app that allows you to stream content from your PC to the DS over Wi-Fi. You also have the ability to use the DS controls as input for your computer. Where this is the most useful is by just using it as a gamepad. The video signal isn't good enough to use this as a streaming option, or at least it's not on my Wi-Fi. I don't know if this could get better than this. Our next game is called Pokemon Chess, and this will allow you to transfer Pokemon between your save files. You can move Pokemon from your save to the chest, or you can copy them. To get them out, all you need to do is visit a Pokemon Center. This is super useful. This is the coolest homebrew game that I came across for this video. This is Super Mario Galaxy DS, and this is the latest version of this game. The team behind this released a demo a while back, but they were nice enough to let me look at some of their recent work. I think this thing is awesome. This platform also has a decent amount of ports and other remakes. I've included some of my favorites in the remainder of this section. But that brings me to the question of whether or not you should buy a DS in 2023. And the short answer is yes, but it depends on a couple of things. And I feel like after I did this entire video, I have a good understanding of who this is for in 2023 and which models of the DS I would recommend that people go out and buy. The first thing that I can say that's probably the easiest is that this is one of the best cheap handhelds that you can get today, especially when you consider all the things that it can do for the asking price. I'm going to have the prices that I paid for all of the things that I used in this video throughout this section so that way you can see my rundown of everything, but these were really cheap devices to get a hold of. The Nintendo DS occupies almost the same space as the PSP when it comes to the types of things that you can do on it. The PSP can do PSP and most PlayStation 1 with a ton of other retro systems, while the DS can do Nintendo DS and Perfect GBA, depending on the model that you have, with a lot of the retro systems that the PSP can do. But it's important to note that some of those systems will run better on the PSP, and the one that comes to mind right away is Super Nintendo. 
If you mod a PSP with an IPS screen, it might be a better option for GBA visually than a Nintendo DS, but the emulator isn't that accurate. If you only care about GBA games, the DS is the cheapest handheld that you can get with a decent screen if you don't have the cash to splash out on an AGS 101 or an IPS mod. If you like DS games, this is the best platform to use to play them. I think they look much better on any of the devices I featured in this video except for the original DS than they would look on an original 3DS or any of the 3DS models that came after it. There are better models than others when it comes to DS games. I think if that was what I was concerned about the most, then I would go for the DSi XL because it looks a lot better than the other models. If you're a novice, software modding a DS is very easy to do and you have a few routes to go with depending on the DS model that you have and your budget. If you have a DSi, you can use software exploits, you can jailbreak your device to allow it to run games and emulators off of an SD card. If you have any of the older DS models, you can also go ahead and get an R4 card, and those are really cheap and easy to get a hold of. And if you have the original DS or the DS Lite, you can also use GBA flashcards. It's also important to note that even though the hardware is old, this is not a dead platform when it comes to community support. Twilight Menu gets new things added to it all the time, and this is a version that just released about two weeks or so ago from when I'm making this video. And as you already saw, the DS even has semi-active development for one game, which is the Super Mario Galaxy DS game. This is the most impressive homebrew that I've ever seen on any platform. But that gets me to my favorite feature of this entire platform, and that is hassle-free wireless co-op with other devices. You can buy a bunch of these and use Download Play to share games running off your R4 or your SD card to your other devices and you don't need to spend any more money. Download Play is a GOAT feature. So after watching all of that, if you want to buy a DS in 2023, I have some advice for you that will hopefully make it easier for you to pick which model you should get. The easiest thing that I can say is I would not buy the original DS unless you can get the CPU 20 motherboard. That motherboard has a brighter screen than the one that I have here. And as you could clearly see in this video, the original screen is a lot worse than the other ones. So if we just exclude that, the rest of the options are easier to choose between. If you just like DS games, then the DSi XL is the best one. It has the best screen for those games, and it is a really good handheld. You're also less likely to have to deal with some of the issues that I pointed out in my issues section because that device is newer than the other ones. If you want one of the smaller devices, then that choice really just comes down to the kind of buttons that you like. The DSi has clicky buttons like the Game Boy Advance SP, so if you like that, then you're going to be right at home with the DSi or the DSi XL. If you like conductive rubber buttons, then the DS Lite is going to be your best option. Personally, I like the feeling of the DS Lite buttons more than the DSi, so I would only use the DS Lite or the DSi XL for my use case. The DSi can do a few things that the DS Lite can't do, but I'm not really interested in any of those, so the DS Lite suits my purpose perfectly. There are a few models of the DS Lite that are worth buying, and if you can find one in a white shell that is in good condition, you should grab it because this thing looks amazing in person. If you can't find one in good condition, then you can just buy a junk one and then do a shell swap. The shell swaps for the DS Lites are way better than the ones from any of the other models. The only other thing that I would pay attention to is the quality of the screen. If you're buying this online, you can ask the person to take a picture of the boot up screen on a DS and that will allow you to see if it has significant yellowing. I would steer clear of any device that has really bad damage on the screens because the replacement screens aren't going to be better than the OEM ones. Hopefully those tips help you out if you are considering buying one of these in 2023. I have a few other deep dive videos like this that I'm planning on doing on other handhelds, so stay tuned for that. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see another, take a look at a video that I did on the PSP in 2023. Happy gaming, everyone. Talk to you out.